Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here. And today I have an exciting new recipe that I would love for you to try. Essentially what's been going on is I noticed that I was wrong. Now, of course, if you wanna skip ahead and not hear the reasoning behind it, you can use the time cues below, but I really think it's important to hear the background and the leading up to this recipe in order to understand why I'm going with this, where the science comes from, and essentially what you'll be looking for in that final cup. I promise I'll try to make it as brief as possible, and then we can get into brewing this cup possibly together if you're in front of your coffee equipment right now. The idea behind what I'm going to propose is to retain volatile organic compounds to the best of our abilities. You might say, well, what about frozen balls, bro? That's actually kind of where this idea came from. I realized there was a common theme in brewers' competitions. The brewer competitor would consistently be explaining the recipe they were using, and during the blooming phase, the very beginning where you wet the grounds with hot water and you see the expansion and the CO2 release, people will consistently say that they're doing a bloom of three times the weight of the grounds in order to really emphasize the aroma of the coffee. And I said it back in, what, 2019 or so, and I, and I see why people say that. Because in your experience, when you're brewing coffee, there's a lot of aroma that releases during the bloom. But that's just it, isn't it? The aroma's being released. You have a ton of it being lost to the atmosphere. During that initial flow of coffee, there's a ton of volatile organic compounds that potentially we would want in our final cup that is being released to the atmosphere and we won't experience it in the cup. Now, volatile organic compounds, what are those? These are not stable acids. These are not these compounds that get into the cup that it doesn't matter about the temperature or anything. They're gonna stay there. These are not measurable by a refractometer. They come out and they go. They come and they go. They come and they go. But these are what are giving us the experience in the cup that really heightens everything. You have some of these volatile organic compounds that contribute to like green fruit notes, some that contribute to roasty notes, to caramel, to cotton candy. So there are some that we really want to retain and there are some that we don't necessarily really, really want. So the big issue here obviously is that when we're brewing coffee and it's flowing down, we see the VOCs, they just kind of start going up and they release into space, but we want them to stay right here. So there's kind of this square thing going on and it's Squarespace, right? Squarespace is a sponsor of today's video. Squarespace is an awesome resource for those of you who might be entrepreneurs that want to really put your presence out there online. Now I've been using Squarespace for many years, both with a coffee shop that I started as well as now with my own branding with LanceHedrick.coffee. So Squarespace can do a lot of things for you. It can create a presence where you can have a social interaction with your followers with, with via some sort of blog space. You can have a shop with all the things on the back end that make it really easy and intuitive, but more importantly, it is the easiest daggum thing to set up. Oh, how do I put a title there? You probably just click the daggum title that's weirdly in Latin and guess what? You can edit it just like that. Squarespace of VOCs, you're good to go. Thriving business in no time, whether you're a basket weaver or you're a fisher person who likes to create bait. It's all there for you. Set that up and guess what? When you use my code in the link below, not only do you help the channel, but you are gonna get 10% off of your Squarespace subscription. Check that out, www.squarespace.com slash Lance Hedrick. Click on that, tracks to me, helps me, helps you, helps us all together. Have some fun with it. But anyway, let's get back into the thriving conversation of volatile organic compounds. Now recently I had the privilege of taking a look at a paper Dr. Samo Smirke is currently submitting to be published. And in this paper he was using espresso and was looking at the release of volatile organic compounds during extraction. The point of this paper was to look at uh, the amount of added fines per dose to see if how fines affected maybe permeability, the homogeneity of the extraction, as well as the volatile organic compounds throughout the extraction and how all that worked. But what I'm taking from this paper was an actual very obvious trends that were going on with the VOCs. Now, in order to measure VOCs, it's a pretty complicated process, so we won't get into that. There are some clear trends in extraction as you continue to push extraction. One of the most desirable VOCs, which really contributes heavily to the fruity notes in your coffee, actually continuously decreases in concentration as the extraction increases. So at around 17%, you're essentially at that highest amount. And then as it increases in percentage of extraction, the amount of those VOCs 
quickly goes down. If the concentration is going down, that means our perception of them are going down. Conversely, there's a negatively tasting VOC, which is kind of like earthy, musty, etc. And essentially, it starts really high at a really low extraction, and it bottoms out at around 19 and a half percent, and then it starts to climb back up as you eclipse 19 to 19 and a half percent. With those two VOCs, we can clearly see a higher extraction will give us less concentration of some of those VOCs we really want and a higher concentration of the ones that we don't really want. Now, of course, there are a lot other VOCs in coffee extraction. This is just a, a, you know, a representative amount, and these are some very important ones that are a bit easier to distinguish when doing the gas chromatography of that headspace above the espresso. But it is really interesting because it can kind of correlate with a lot of the experiences we all have when tasting coffee. And it probably explains why a very common trend in the World Brewers Championship is to brew at extremely low extraction yields. I have not seen in a long time a coffee that exceeded 20% in extraction at the World championship. Typically, I see 17 to 18%. And a big reason for this is to allow for a process forward cup with these heavily processed coffees, but it's also because you have the least amount of bitterness and you have the highest concentration of acidic compounds. And the rest of it, you can kind of tailor your water to curb the issues. So I remember in the video I made with Samo Smirke a few, uh, about a month or so ago, by the time of this video, when you are at about 20% extraction, these are just rough numbers, about 80% of your caffeine has been extracted. About 70% of the bitter compounds have been extracted. And about 90% of those acids have been extracted. Whenever we're extracting coffee, because of the temperature we're using, those a lot of those early VOCs, which are actually really positive, tend to dissipate. So this chill compound chilling has come out, which will help to retain a lot of those volatiles. And it's actually a pretty effective means of doing it. Does it work well for every coffee? Well, of course not, because all these coffees have different volatiles that come out at different rates and in different concentrations can taste di very differently. As you know, coffee is very complex and it's very frustrating to deal with. But is frozen balls the best way of dealing with it? Well, I don't necessarily think so. I don't. I, I rarely ever use them, to be honest with you. It's just an extra thing to keep in the house and to keep frozen and to clean and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I was thinking of a, a, an alternative way to utilize this research in order to improve my coffee without having to rely on that. And as I was talking with Samo, he was sharing with me this research that was done. Essentially, it was showing the uh, the releasing of volatile or organic compounds at different temperatures over time. And in reality, those early extracting ones, not only do they extract early and are very volatile, but they extract incredibly easily. They come out of the coffee without much effort. You don't need to use boiling water to get them out. They're not they're not staying into the coffee ground so hard that you have to like prod them out. They're ready to go. We don't necessarily need to go in there with, you know, you know, let's get our boiling water and punch them out of the grounds. No, we don't need to do that. What if we just did a cooler bloom? So in the opposite way, a lot of people think, let's do a really hot bloom and then cool the water down for the rest of it, because that makes sense, right? You wanna control or manipulate the variables that you are able to control in order to lessen the bitterness or the over extraction. So a lot of people think, go really, really hot and then cool it down for the rest of the shot. But in reality, that's not nearly as effective as you think it might be. And once everything's really in motion, lessening the temperature doesn't have nearly the effect you think it does, because a lot of those things, a lot of those VOCs and acids and everything that come out later, come out largely because of time. The idea was, well, what if we use like a 50 or 60 degree bloom? Then it's not too hot where it's gonna be evaporating into the environment as you're brewing and you could duplicate the results of compound chilling without having to mess with all of that. Now I know that in the US, this is obviously going to be a little bit more difficult because you run on 110 volts, but the idea is simple. I like to set my kettle to 50, 60 degrees. I'll do my bloom, then I'll replace the kettle back to like a 95 degree centigrade and uh, you know let it bloom for a minute or two depending on how long the kettle takes to heat up. Now on 110 volts, it's gonna take a little bit longer to heat up, but in reality, letting that bloom go a bit longer is not, that's not gonna hurt anything at all. It's just going to increase the extraction a bit. But when doing something like this, it's important to note that when you're using that cooler water at the beginning, the extraction threshold is gonna lower, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Really high extractions will 
tend to taste a lot worse. What you really want to focus on is extraction efficiency and evenness of extraction. Now, of course, it's been shown in papers that the finer you grind something, the more VOCs are released, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. This isn't a video saying this is the way, this changes everything. This is a video where I do a little interpretive dancing on accident and I ask you to try it out with me and to see if you have any of these results that might be really neat. And I'm calling this the Samo Bloom. One kettle, I'm gonna set at 50 degrees centigrade. The other one at 96. I'm going to bloom three times the weight of my coffee, both from same water chemistry. Now, of course, when you're seeing this, there won't be nearly as much obvious like expansion of the grounds because the water is a lot cooler than the hotter water. Then my next pour will be to my target weight, which is just like my one to one recipe. So I'm just doing a bloom, one will be cool, one will be at temp, then a two minute bloom, and then boom to my target weight, and then we'll measure them both, measure the extraction, and then we'll just do a little simple taste test. I'll have we'll go mix it up and we'll do a little blind taste and we'll see which one tastes better. The point of this is not to say, hey, this is a fix all for everything. In the same way that free uh, compound chilling, they even say this isn't the best for every coffee. In the same, this isn't either. Maybe you're missing out on a lot of these early volatile compounds that could really elevate your coffee to the next level. Maybe you find that this tastes great on all of your coffees and it's an easy enough addition to your workflow that you just wanna do the Samo Bloom with everything. Who knows? I don't know. That's why I'm pitching it here for you. And I would love for you all to take in part with me and kind of make this just a big experiment where we're all, all from around the world tasting this out and seeing what the differences are. Without further ado, for those people who are skipping to here, we're about to do the recipe. You stink for skipping. Not really. You can always go back and watch the reasoning. It is a ramble, but I think it's really helpful. But welcome to the brew section. Done brewing, 15 in, 250 grams of water. I did do one swirl at the end just to make sure a flat draw through. They both ran at about the same time. The extraction yield of the hot bloom was as expected, a little bit higher, about half a percent higher uh, with a bit higher. Uh, the TDS was actually uh, just a little bit higher. There was less that came out, which was interesting. Uh, so I guess that means the hotter temperature at the beginning allowed for more water to be absorbed. That's speculation, that's a one-off, who knows. But in the end, there, these are going to be two completely different brews. Uh, because the extraction was was different. So with compound chilling, one thing that it does is you'll brew uh, one without and one with, and the extraction should be roughly the same without you know user error. So the big difference there is going to be the volatile compounds. Uh, with this one, you're also going to extract a bit less. Uh, so that, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. So uh, you can always go finer if you want to open up more volatile organic compounds, or you can you know enjoy the lower extraction or do what you like with that. But in the end, what matters is taste. So I'm gonna go ahead and have Ugo switch these up. Now, for those of you with misophonia or don't like the sound of slurps, uh, I advise you to look away or close your ears or skip ahead because um, we're going to Slurp City. So, slurp. Again, the C is on the bottom of the two cold blooms or summer blooms. So, with um, my guesses, I'm gonna say that these are the um, the cold bloom and these are the hot bloom. These two had a worse finish and they didn't have nearly as much. There was more, um, and I could be talking out my butt if I get these wrong, but it seemed like there was a more muted uh, aromatic experience with these, which led me to believe these. And then the fact that these ones, maybe I was getting in my head after that experience and was thinking these should taste like higher extraction, maybe a bit of bitterness came through. Anyway, without much further ado, let's see if I'm making a fool of myself or if these are correct. So I said these should have the C's on the bottom. That one has a C. That one has a C, so we're good to go. Got those correct. All right, sweet. The temperature difference is gonna is gonna be crucial, but I think you could go up even to 70 or maybe even 80 degrees and still have that volatile difference. It's when you get to those really high temperatures, just essentially the higher you go, the more volatiles are released. 
So honestly, you could do an 80 degree bloom and likely experience the, the, the uh, increase and that would not give you nearly as much of a disparity between extraction yields. In fact, it'd probably be a lot closer. The biggest issue here is not the water that makes it through the bed at the beginning, because that's very little water that makes it through, but it's the amount of time it takes for that hot water to equalize the bed temperature in order to hit the, the in order to hit higher temps. And so it takes a bit longer for that deep extraction to really occur. You could even try like 80 degrees, 85 degrees and see if that makes a difference for your brew. But the goal here is, is obviously we always want to try to make as even extraction as possible but we also want to retain some of those VOCs. Again, not all of them are the best in the world, so it's not just let's throw a frozen rock, whiskey rock underneath and just yeet the whole shot over it, the whole pour over. No, but some of those early ones we're missing out on, especially if you take a long time to sip that coffee, you want to experience it. Try it at different, different degrees, try it at different times, different blooms, and report back here. If you have something unique that you've found with certain coffees, maybe you see a trend, maybe Ethiopia coffees tend to be heavily aromatic when you do something like this, or maybe you find you like it better on heavily processed coffees. Report back here, let's share our findings and let's figure out uh, if there's more to this, and maybe in the future we'll, we'll have a nice little scientific study dedicated to something like this. As usual, thank Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoy the content, please hit that like and subscribe. Check out my Patreon where we do some fun giveaways and have a nice Discord community. But in the end, my number one hope is that you brew something tasty today. And cheers.